Nuno Betancourt, give it up. Thank you so much. How do you how do you enjoy those cruises? How do I what those? How cruises? do you enjoy them? You know, um, I really I do enjoy them actually. I mean, it's it's yeah. yeah see, we're that's on the how much I enjoy them. <laughs> No, I mean, look, you know, you when I when I tell somebody about it, they're like, wow, it sounds amazing. Uh, you're four days and you're stuck on a boat with 3,000 fans? What? And But it's great. You know, it, you, instead of hiding, you just go out and you just pretty much, by the end of the cruise, you meet every single person as you're walking. It, it's a it's a four-day meet and greet and, right. hey, you know, and it happens. But I love, I love playing the shows. The shows are great. The crowds are great, man. It's always a... And you're great about it, too, because there are... A lot of people go out and hang with the fans and walk around and see shows, but there are some people that kind of hide a little bit because they don't want to deal with it. But you like to get right out there in it, right? You could kind of walk out... Of, man of the people. Even coming here, I said to Nuno, I go, we got a, we got a sort of a staging room if you want to. He goes, no, no, I'll go hang at the bar. I want to be out there. You, you like connecting and hearing what the fans have to say? I don't know. You know, yeah, I do. You know, I think it's uh, it's good for my ego. You know, it's just people tell you they love you all day. It's incredible. I don't know what's so hard about that. <laughs> when you hear, speaking of hearing great things, Miles Kennedy just here talking about the mark you made on him when he heard you play guitar. When you hear things like that from whether it be fans or other established musicians, I imagine it's it's got to make you feel pretty good, right? It actually makes me feel uncomfortable. Does it? it, it I started sweating when he started saying that it's, it's semi embarrassing I don't I don't know why that is. I, I've never been able to. Uh, it's always hard. I mean, I've always maintained being a fan. You know, I, I think no matter how much success we had at the band or whether we did arenas or or did clubs, I always felt like a fan. Of, of everyone, <laughs> so it's like it's always hard to believe that people look at you in that same way. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, I thought it was nice of him, but I always take it as like complete bullshit. I don't know. I just, I think he's just trying to be nice. But look, if if it's true, it's great. But it's like I said, it's always difficult to uh, to imagine it. I mean, uh, just just I think it was yesterday, maybe yesterday, a couple of days ago, uh, our. Our home station, WAF, that we grew up on, shut down. They got bought out. Nobody knew they got bought out two days before by a Christian station. So we called in to, you know, everybody was like panicking and calling in because mm -hmm. it was 50, like, you know, since we were kids, we grew up with that. I have a show on that station right now. That's, yeah, yeah. so I know, yeah. Yeah, so, so, the, so when they asked about, you know, we were remembering and, and about the first time, the greatest time you ever heard, you know, your own songs on the, on the, on the station that you grew up on. That you grew up listening to Halen and Zeppelin and and all the bands and hearing your songs side by side to those that was awkward. It was probably one of the greatest days of, of my life to actually be in a car at home and hearing a DJ that you've been listening to your whole life say, "Well, this is the new extreme." It's 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 still bizarre. I mean, honest to God, when you came back and you were just playing this sort of vamp that you do before you come back, my heart started racing. It's like, wow, I'm on, I'm on the air. It's it's just you never get used to it. Do you, you know? remember? I mean, w the specific moment where you were when you first heard Extreme played on the radio was it on AAF in Boston? Was that the first time you heard yourself on the radio? It was. It was. And I, was it Kid Ego? It was. You know what? It was. Um, it was Kid Ego. It was we were coming back from a, a gig in in Connecticut, and we were just Connecticut, and we were just crossing over the Massachusetts border, and it was like two in the morning, and kind of passing out in the car, and, and it came on, and when the, you know when the DJ for the first time says your band's name on the air, and, and that's it's everything. It's every it's the dream that every musician and every band waits for. I, it's not so much the platinums and the golds. That's all nice and the touring, but it's to hear yourself on the radio when you grow up with radio. There is just there is nothing that will ever replace that moment. I mean, obviously, Miles was being serious about what he said about you as a player. A lot of people have said it. I mean, you've made a hu you made a huge mark. And the for, if people want any proof of this, the, the, uh, talk about problem. Talk about somebody that was one of your heroes being blown away by your playing. The, one of, it's got to be one of the most surreal moments in your life because there is video of Brian May. Talking about Nuno solo on Get the Funk Out, I think. Yeah. And saying it's one of the greatest guitar solos he's ever heard in his life. And not only saying that, but also, is he trying to replicate it? Yeah, he was doing a bit of air guitar. When Brian May's air guitaring your solo, that's pretty badass. That's pretty that's pretty cool. I, you know how many how many uh you know, heroes we had to pay for him to say all that shit? <laughs> 
couldn't think it was pounds. I don't know if they still do pounds. I have no idea what's that. Still pounds? Or still? All right, yeah, but... Uh, what no, was but that, that, that for? Was amazing. What was that for again? You know, it was for the uh, the DVD that we shot at uh, in, in Vegas, I right, believe, right, and right. Uh, at the at the Joint Vegas. And But, you know, we, look, we, we've had these moments where... You know, you're right. Like your heroes, your your Mount Rushmore of guitar players that you that you get to run in, you know, into. Like for me, it was always, it was you know, it was uh, it was always Brian, it was Paige, Eddie, and uh, that fourth spot is always kind of hard between Hendrix because Hendrix wasn't necessarily my generation, right. but it, those are the people that changed the game, you know. And uh, I remember being. Um, you know, we were we were about to perform with Extreme a few years, maybe a few years, gone probably about eight, ten years ago. And we were about to do the Astoria in London, and it was closing. So they asked us. It was one of the first shows we ever did when we went over, and uh, they asked us if we would do the last two shows there. So we said, "Great!" And we're about to go on, and uh, and the we're about I don't know twenty minutes away, and the door opens, pigeons fly through, <laughs> angels sing, and Jimmy Page walked in the door. Oh wow. And uh, and I thought he was in the wrong. <laughs> I thought he was in the wrong. Room. I was like, can I, can I? Are you lost? Can I help you? Uh, and he's like, No, man. I came to see you perform. I wanted to see you perform in an intimate place. And you know, that's that's Jimmy Page. And you know, th that's the pages of of the no, oh, the pages, the actual pages, the Jimmy Pages yeah. of the rock and roll book of guitar players. And uh, and he, when he said, you know, he came to, you know, see the band, I. I, I, you know, I was sweating the whole time. We were talking in the dressing room for a while in the corner, just about guitars. He was talking about Portugal, how he goes to Portugal to, to buy this specific guitar. Uh, well, it's alcohol. He goes to get called uh, Queixasa. It's like Portuguese moonshine. Yeah, Queixasa. There you go. And then, and then there's these Portuguese uh, guitarra da terra, which is the the uh, traditional guitar. And he's telling me this. And so, as they leave, right before we go on, our booking agent comes in. And he goes, Hey, Nuno, don't get too excited, you know, because. Jimmy usually says hi. I take him to a bunch of shows, you know, whether it's Foo Fighters or whether it's Muse and stuff. He wants to come see the bands, but you know he's getting a bit older and he's probably gonna catch like three or four songs and then he's gonna leave. Mm. And I'm like, great. I mean, that's why he said hi to you before the show. Right. So when we got, we got on stage, I played the whole show for him anyways. But you know, the story is intimate enough that we could see the table and the part that I missed, which is he's gonna be upset with me, is. Ten minutes after Jimmy Page walked in, the door opened and John Paul Jones walked in. Oh my gosh! No bullshit. And I had invited him though, because we played together in Japan. But I didn't know if he was coming. So he walks in the door ten minutes after Page. Page looks at him and goes, "What the fuck are you doing here?" <laughs> and he goes, "What the fuck are you doing here?" And it was you can like, say fuck. I, I can say fuck. Yeah, okay. yeah. What the fuck? No, but he's in. So in the dressing room, we had half a Led Zeppelin in the dressing room, and they sat together. So we went on stage in the balcony. They were at the front row balcony at a table, side by side, just sitting there and just like, you know, critiquing the show. But, you know, those, that was a long set we did. We did about two and a half hours. I kept looking up. We play, kept looking up, play. They stayed the whole show. Wow. Stayed the encore. Stay, it was it was pretty incredible, man. He watched the whole gig. Does that affect your performance? Like, are you absolutely? <laughs> How, in what you way? forget there's an audience. You forget there's a band. You're just in your bedroom and you're like, I'm playing for them. It's Zeppelin. They're in the building, and you you change the way you play. You can't help it. Like you 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 almost adapt to what. Geez, what would he like if I played here? What, you pull what, out a violin bow, or what'd you do? <laughs> but you know, I remember doing like Midnight Express, and and Midnight Express, the the piece that I do was inspired. And I said it. I didn't want to mention their names on stage, but I, it was inspired by Four Sticks, like the the rhythm of it. And and uh, I said I stole this from one of the best. One of the besties in the room tonight. I didn't mention his name, but to be able to play that stuff and uh, and then to get a text later, I got a, a text later, uh, Robbie, I got a text from my booking agent, and he made a comment that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say on the air, but it's because uh, it's kind of a little bit bragatory, and you know I don't like to be uncomfortable. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, but it was. I mean, that, that's that got to be just surreal to look out there and you it, see it half is. a Zeppelin it's, watching it's, you play. You always flash back to you. Every time I post something like that, I always talk about, people probably think I'm crazy, but I talk about my my bedroom in Hudson, Massachusetts, where you sat there and you learned everything by taking the needle of the Zeppelin record, play just two seconds, stop it, try to figure it out, play it, and then it's cassettes. But you sat in that laboratory in your bedroom for hours, 16, 17 hours a day, and then to be on a stage and look up and they're coming to see you, it's, it's bizarre. It's, 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 a, it's beyond a dream. It's beyond, I'm beyond grateful and thankful. And, but it, after it happens, you almost still believe it never really happened. It just, uh, 
It's hard to believe. Speaking of surreal moments in your career, and we're going to talk about a new record Extreme has coming out and some other stuff in a second, but speaking of surreal moments, the performance that you guys did at the Brian May tribute show at Wembley Arena. Queen tribute, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Queen, tri- yeah, yeah. The Queen tribute. Uh, well, I should say Brian the Freddie Mercury. Uh, Freddie Mercury, We're, we're yeah. both screwed. We're both yeah, we're both screwed. Up. The Freddie Mercury tribute. <laughs> Freddie Mercury tribute concert. Right. Yeah. Was uh, just unbelievable, but you've told me in the past that you actually weren't, it wasn't what you were supposed to do. Ex- no. uh, explain what happened. We got into a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. It was, you know, Brian May is probably, if you open the dictionary and you look up sweetest guy in yes. the world, he's, that's him. And uh, I've never seen him angry before until that day. Actually, the day before, I we went into a rehearsal. All these, you know, different legends that were there. If you guys saw it, everybody from Bowie to Guns N' Roses. I mean, and everybody and anybody. Metallica. That, Metallica. Yeah, Def Leppard. It was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Liza Minnelli. It was. It was pretty. It was pretty crazy. But uh, I, I kind of whispered. I was doing Love of My Life and I was showing Brian and I whispered into his ear and said, hey, just so you know, I wanted to give you a heads up. We're not going to do any extreme stuff. We got this great Queen tribute we put together. And he looked at me, like, he just he just went like just blank. And I was like, uh-oh. And he goes, y- you can't do that. And I was like, why not? We want to pay tribute to Freddie. We're, we're massive. You know, even when he opens, the, probably the thing that was most nerve-wracking is what F- Brian opened with and he introduced us. He said, you know, these, these guys are coming up next, so they're probably the only band in the world that truly know what Queen were all about. And when he said that, like, we got so nervous. And by the way, he was right when he said that. And, 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 uh, and he didn't want us to do it because he wanted Extreme to be Extreme. Everybody did their own sets, and they were doing a lot of the stuff at the end. So a lot of the songs that we chose in our medley, it was supposed to be done with only Queen. And then, so we, we didn't argue, but I was just really adamant about doing it. And then he finally gave me a blessing. He wasn't very happy about it. But it was probably the, one of our greatest moments ever on a stage, probably for, for this band. It was, in, yeah, it was truly incredible. And that's why, because I often wondered after I saw that show, and there's obviously it was shot in the video and the document, that... You were the only band that did Queen songs, but mm. you were really told not to, and you went ahead and did it anyway. Well, you know me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a nice guy. So when you come off stage, was there heat about it, or were... No, it was actually magical all the way around. I remember John Deacon, their bass player, on the side of the stage. He said he started listening to it in the car, and he pulled over to listen. He, we had John, Elton John came over and kissed me on the lips. Oh. I still haven't. <laughs> you saw him wash your face? No. No, I mean, look, it was, it, was, it was incredible. It was magical. And I think it was, it was a true celebration of why we were there. It was, it, was, it was actually the most honest version of it. I know the end was all the collaboration, but I don't know. I still feel like we, we probably did the tribute the way it was supposed to be done. And it was, it was some of the deep cuts, but it was, it was everything that Freddie encompassed. And the, and the crowd. Yeah. The crowd approved. <laughs> yeah, big you know. time. Was it, do, is it safe to say one of your highlights as a musician? Oh, that? without a doubt. Top yeah. three, maybe. What would be the other two? Off I mean, the top look, of your head. probably listening, like I said earlier, probably your time, first time you hear a song of yours, you know, on the radio. I mean, if you're talking about stuff within the band, I know I mentioned stuff as a guitar player with Paige and stuff. I mean, all those are in the top ten. But I, I, think, I think getting a call... Um, you know, when uh, we were in Germany somewhere and, you know, we had been touring in a van a lot in the States in that first album. And then we started a tour with Alice in Chains in the U.S. on Porn Graffiti. And, uh, and then nothing was really happening that big for the band. We we're still doing clubs. We got to Europe and I got a phone call. No, it was back in the 1900s, so there's no cell phones. Huh? <laughs> and, uh, and I got a phone call. My manager calls me. He goes, hey, I just wanted to let you know that Billboard called and More Than Words will be number one tomorrow in America and, and uh, on the charts. So I have a number one single probably in your homeland. Is That was, that was a big one. That was a big one first. Yeah, I, I would think so. Were, were, you, were you aware when you and Gary sat down and wrote More Than Words, which is something so out of the norm from the rest of the record, w- did you have any idea of how special and enduring that song was going to be at the time? No. No, because we just wrote songs. It was just another song that you know we wrote on a porch, and then we go in and we write another one, and then we had we you know for the first album we had like fifty songs. More than words was written before before pornography. It was written. It could have been on the first album. It was towards the end of it, and and, and we just we put it on because it was 
the song we wanted to put on. And, and the, the, the first person who knew, there's one person that knew it was going to go to number one and be a hit. He came into the studio. He listened to it once. Uh, he's, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple clues. 6'4", maybe, singer, out of his mind. 6'4", singer, out of his mind. Thank you. Who? <laughs> Sebastian Bach? Sebastian came to the studio and he goes, Dude! That's going to number one. He goes, that's going to number one. Literally. For real? Before the la label didn't think so, band didn't think so, Sebastian was like, and then he says, then he goes, that's going to number one, and I'm going to start managing you guys today. I'm now your manager. What was he doing there? He was just stopping by. Th those were crazy days. Like, you know, recording, we recorded in L.A. in the Valley. We recorded that album here, so people would pop in all the time. I mean, we had a, uh, I was hanging out with Dweezil Zappa a lot at that time, and I was producing an album for him right after we finished, and there was a lot of people showing up. At one point, Dweezil showed up, and he was already in the studio, and he was shooting pool, and I, and I walked in, and he was with this guy, and I said, man, well, this guy looks so familiar to me, and, uh, and I couldn't figure it out, so I pulled him aside, and I said, hey, who's, who's your friend? Who's that? He goes, oh, he, he whispers, he goes, oh, that's George Harrison's son, and I'm like, wow. It's like, you know, it's the royalty in the room. We ended up hanging with him and George Harrison's son for like a month. I mean, crashing at our place, feeding him, taking him everywhere. By the time Porn Graffiti was released and we had the party on Sunset at a place called Spice, I saw, I saw Dweezil and I said, yo, uh, where's, where's your boy? And he goes, man, don't, 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 don't even... I'm sorry, it wasn't Dweezil. Sebastian was hanging with him. My bad, my bad, my bad. Sebastian was hanging with him. And, uh, and when Dweezil walked in, he said, yo, man, this guy was saying to Dweezil, it's good when all the kids hang out, isn't it? Like all the kids. And Dweezil's like, what, what's this guy talking about? So when he told me he's been... You know, Sebastian said he's been hanging out with him for months. Saw him at the release party. I said, where is he? He goes, don't even mention that motherfucker's name, man. If I see him on a beat, that's not George Harrison's son. He was lying to me the whole time. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> unbelievable. He was, like, feeding him for months, letting him crash at his pad. <laughs> it like was a um, grifter. Good old, and this is, this is obviously pre-internet like internet because you could Google that shit now. But yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. One last thing before we go to break about this subject. So I was working part-time in a record store when Porno Graffiti came out. You must be aware of how many housewives brought that record back to the store when they purchased the entire album and heard the open to decadence dance and was like, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. For as many as we sold, about 30% of them would come back and oh, they'd drop it on the counter and be like, you just gotta give me the single. I don't know, this is not, get the devil, funk out. What worship. the hell is this? Yeah, were you aware that that was going on? Oh, listen, you know, being Queen fans and knowing what we had, the, the label was confused. The label didn't even want to put out more than words. They didn't think it was a hit anyways. Because you got to remember, this is before MTV Unplugged. And there was nowhere to play. Because it's not like since the 70s, like James Taylor. All the ballads out that time were all big power ballads. If you remember, like big cannon snares. And they're all massive songs. Here we are with an acoustic guitar and sitting on two stools. The, the, the label's like, that, there's no way we can put that out. Who's going to play it? What station is going to play it? They had to test market it. They would not play, release that song as a single. Like I had to, like I did with the Freddie Mercury tribute, I had to quit the band in a meeting with the president of the label to release more than words as a single. Was there pushback from the label to even include it on the no, album? No, because they, they knew that's what was different and special about us, that we, we didn't really care that we didn't sound like anybody specifically. We had a bit of a funk element. We had horns on the album. You know, nobody was right. doing horns. And, and we had like songs like When I First Kissed You, there was a Sinatra track, and then we had More Than Words, which is like an like a Everly Brothers track. So we were all over the place, but we just wrote songs that we loved, you know, and... and we didn't really overthink it or think that it couldn't belong or it just, you know, did what we did. We didn't care what anybody tells us. We still, we still don't. I used to love when I would work in that store and people would come in and I would be able to pick, I, I would sell them a copy of porno graffiti on cassette or CD or whatever. And I would just look at them. I would tell the manager, I go, that's coming back in about two hours <laughs> two, uh, because you know, I, I hate to profile, but you could profile. Oh, yeah. Listen, the rockers would be like, okay, we're cool with the rest of the record, but you saw the housewives and stuff and I'm like, that's coming it, back. It it wasn't just the records, it was on stage. So you should have seen the audience faces. Like they'd come to see this band to do wholehearted oh, and wow, more than work. I didn't think of and that. And then we'd open with Decadence and you'd be like, and, they'd, and we'd see them all looking at their tickets going, <laughs> <laughs> this is the right band? This is the 
<laughs> are they coming on next? Like, is it? Man, people were like so confused. We opened for Bon Jovi at one point, and it was just nobody knew what the hell, like what what they were watching. They didn't know, you know. Gary's got like a black guy, one shoe off. It's like nobody knew what was happening. It was just uh, it was a mess. Classic stuff. All right, we got to take a break. Now, you, of course, now live here in L.A. Do yeah. you, where we're sitting here at the Rainbow, which is a, such an iconic spot for, for everybody who's a rock fan. Do you remember the first time you ever came here? <laughs> yeah. You got a good Rainbow <laughs> story for me? Yeah, because, man, back then, coming to the Rainbow, it was, it was everybody was here hanging out. It was, it was insane. I remember, I think Roth was here. David Lee Roth was here the night I came. Uh, I think... I remember Jason Bonham was sleeping in the bar. His head was down. God bless you, Jason. I think I helped him up. I helped him carry him out. I was, uh, it was everybody was here. It was, it was such a great, great hang. Such a it was full of electricity, man. Those days, incredible. It still is. It's still it's still it's still a great vibe here. But, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about new extreme music. Long awaited, and it is now almost complete. Give us the update. Tell us about it. When's it coming out? You know, uh, when it, it's 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 done in the sense where it's done. As a matter of fact, Gary flies back in tomorrow in to LA just to we're doing a, uh, he's doing a few uh, a few touch ups, uh, some stuff that we did, a few fixes of ch- stuff we changed, lyrics we changed in the songs. But that's it. He he's doing the final touch ups. All the guitars, bass, drums are done. Mixes are pretty much done. And uh, we're you know the the release is really going to depend on a label because we we've kind of been working towards the good thing about not releasing anything for a while is where. We're free and clear of, I think, anything that we had, which we're really excited about because I haven't been this excited about an album in, in, in a long, long time. I'm like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably one of the hungriest sounding extreme albums I've ever done. Uh, it's, it's, it's heavy and it's, uh, I don't know, it's, just, it's full of fire and I think there's a lot of great, interesting, out of all that stuff, we always say we have interesting tracks on there. We call them the obscure tracks. We got a few of those, really interesting stuff, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I would say that this is even probably uh, Gary's best album he's done. I, I, this is his album, I would say. How long has it been? And I always struggle with the title of the last record. Saudé, 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 Saudé de Rock. Is no, that Saudage, Saudage, Saudage de Rock. Saudage de Rock. How long has it been since that record? Oh, God, anybody? Twelve. Who, 12 who said it? 2008. Twelve years. So that would be twelve years since yeah. an extreme record. That's right. Why twelve years? Why not? <laughs> uh, no, you know what? To be honest with you, we, we didn't wait that long. We we probably have about three to four albums done. Like not done, done, but we we did we did an album pretty quickly, and it was just like, I, you know, I always one thing I always said to Gary ever, ever since we started this band is like I never want to release anything that I can't wait to play people like that I that I just can't wait to share. I don't want to put out albums just for the sake of putting out albums. And I love the stuff we were doing, but then I started writing some other stuff that I like better. And then kind of scrapped that. And, so, and then we, I latched onto something. We, we thought we had an album done about two years ago. And then I just tapped into like these three or four songs that I just, it was a stop the presses kind of moment for me. And I went, that's it. It reminded me of when we kind of tapped into porn graffiti back then to me, where it was like, oh, it's like a big kind of uppercut. And that's, uh, it, you know, Gary refers to this album as porno uh, 2.0 every time he jokes about it. But it's very much like that, that kind of exci- excitement for us. Is the danger of the where we're at in the music business now, like you said, you don't have a record deal, you're doing this on, on your own, and you... You well, we're not doing it on our own, though. Th- that's what I probably should have finished my thought, is that we're going to go to labels. Right. But the process of creating it, you're doing on your own. Oh, in yeah, other words, you're not it's, signed it's, while no, you're doing it's it. It's done. It's going to be mixed, and it's got to be somebody that's going to take it and go, we, we get what you're doing, and we're ready to you know, put it out in a few months. You know, marketing plan and get it going. But not having an A&R guy or somebody at a label imposing deadlines and saying, this needs to be done by then, you need to deliver by then. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Probably would have had an album earlier than 12 years. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Time-wise, definitely. Um, but you know what? We, I don't ever remember having an A&R guy. I don't. I don't. Nobody ever bothered me. Nobody ever bothered us. You know, producers never bothered us. You know, the producers that are on the albums, truthfully, 
Uh, no offense, love all of them, but they didn't really do much. They let us do our thing. They let me do my thing, and they they were there. Michael Wagner, who I love, he let us record the album. He finished it, and he came and, and he mixed it. And even though he popped in every day, and he just he saw you know a good producer. The the job of a great producer is to do sometimes 100% or 90 or sometimes to do 10 to 0. Sometimes you just got to get out of the way and let and, and if it's working it's working. That's what a great producer does. The bad producers impose their impose themselves on every band and you know it's them. You know it's their album and uh, you know everybody I think we've been blessed enough to work with has recognized that we had a vision of what we do. And it's crazy. It's 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 always different every album but uh but that that's that's what we did. And that's what we do in this album. You know this album might scare you people i don't know is is do you consider porno graffiti to be the best extreme album i don't know i i, I think i think the the, uh, the best album is up for the listeners to know i don't i couldn't tell you i i don't i've you know I, ever since i've started recording i've never gone back and listened to one of the albums is that right ever ever I do it so much like, you know, creating it and I live in it and I'm inside of it and every hi-hat pattern, every sound, every little thing to the point that it's like, it's so us and it's, it's that I don't ever want to hear it again. It's for, it's for, it's for them to hear and for them to enjoy. And, and, for, and my part is to play it live and I, I enjoy that part of it, of interpreting it live and getting to do it. But, you know, it's like looking at old photographs. Like I listen to porno and I'm just like, oh God. It's too fast. The song's too fast. Like, the, the, we sound like we sound like chickens with a head. Like the tempos are too too slow. That one's too fast. We're, Gary's just like you know, it's not patient enough. Like it literally is. I think every artist I've ever worked with listens to their old stuff and cringes. cringes well, it's funny always. you say that because Miles and Mark, who were here earlier, they were saying they've now got six records and they've ne they don't listen to their old music at all. Of course. And they said Why the, would you? <laughs> well, they said the only time they hear it. Is when they do meet and greets, <laughs> they play the music and he, and they'll sit in there and be like, "What is this?" And they're like, do "You know how you know how much conversation every time we do a, a meet and greet, right? Which we do after shows or on the cruise or anywhere. You'll always people will be coming up and they hear the band like whispering and talking. It's because our music's playing and all we're doing is critiquing it and like, what the <laughs> fuck were we thinking? Like, what? God, what the fuck? Were we, what lyric is that, Gary? Are you fucking kidding me? Did we approve that? Is that?" Is that you know, Susie sells seashells by the seashore. Like, what the, what the fuck were you thinking? But you know, it's just. But you just grow up, you know, or or, or you for the sometimes not not for the better. You just change and you grow. You just grow, and so we we get a kick out of listening to the to the stuff. Yeah, it surprises. So, some of my favorite stuff in Nuno's catalog is an album called. I love an album called Waiting for the Punchline, which I think would have done a lot better, obviously, if it would have come out in say '89 <laughs> and mid '90s. Yeah. Uh, the the backlash at that point to that kind of music was yeah. so severe that I remember. I remember I was working at a radio station in New Jersey at the time, and these guys were coming through to do promo for the record, and I said to the PD, you know, I want to have them on, and my show was on the weekend only, and these guys showed up, you'll never remember this, but these guys showed up in the lobby, and I was like, I said to my program director, like, hey, so I'm going to go on the air with them now, they go, no, no, you go in the production studio, and I said, what are you talking about? They go... That can't they we can't air extreme in the middle of the day talking yeah. about a new record. And gotta, I said, What are you talking it. about? It's a great record. They go, No, we gotta pre record it and we'll cut it down to like two minutes and we'll run it on oh, yeah, I remember, midnight I remember. on Saturday night or whatever. And I was like livid about it. I was like, Are you what is, but that's how well, what year was that? Like ninety five, probably ninety four. Yeah, ninety four, ninety four, ninety five. And, and I was just like, Man, is this bullshit? And I was like, I was so offended by it because I'm such a fan of the band and rock music in general. I'm like, what's happening here? And you had a song on that record, which kind of spoke to that in Hip Today, right? <laughs> yeah, it was about us. <laughs> but, but I love that. It was, self, it was a... I yeah. love what you were saying there. Like, yeah, look, we, we knew. We saw the writing on the wall. We knew that, like, it, was, it, was, it wasn't written at anybody else. It was written that, that that's what happens. It goes, we go, goes through waves. And not that we... The, at that point when we were doing it, we didn't think we were... I didn't think I was leaving the band, to be honest with you. We, we call that album Waiting for the Breakup, actually. But, uh, you know, we were touring and we were going through... You know, we never took... We hadn't taken a break in eight years. And that's why... That's why we were at, at each other's, you know, throats, and I just, I left, and I left, and Gary, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of people think Gary left the band to do Van Halen, that was not the case. I left the band months before that, and then we happened to have the same managers, and, and they wanted Gary to come down, but, uh, but I, you know, I didn't mind that Gary got blamed for that, that was good. <laughs> Gary took the I'll bullet. Say, Thanks, Gary. <laughs> It would have probably freaked you out even more that you know that he read an interview. Yeah, you did. exactly. You know, and, and the, the but the 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 bad part about the day is 
the 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 horrible part is is the second I started playing Get the Funk Out, I was super disappointed. It sounded just like me. <laughs> it didn't sound anything like Eddie. Same guitar, same amp, cable, DNA that's on the strings. I mean, it, it's it's. It, I learned a lesson that day that your hands, comes from your hands, your fingers, your touch, right and left hand. Yeah, I mean, it had a bit of the sound, but no, way, it sounded just like me playing a different rig. Yeah, I, I learned I learned the hard way that yeah. you, you are who you are. You can't, you know. I've talked to so many guitar players over the years that have told me that they've gone after someone's sound. I just had this conversation the other day with somebody who was like talking about, yeah, I tried so hard to get Ty Tabor from King's X's sound, and then I realized I'm not Ty Tabor. You know, it's just that it has to come from from the, the hands. We got to go to a break. We have a few more minutes when we come back. But I do want to fill the audience in on something because Nuno left a little bit of a cliffhanger earlier in the hour when he said about the whole Jimmy Page thing and Page coming to watch him. And then Nuno said that there was a text and he didn't like to say what it said because it sounds self-serving or whatever. But that text said from Jimmy Page about that performance. You can shine my shoes anytime. <laughs> no. That Jimmy said it was one of the top five. And I said, I don't want to repeat. He said uh, top, top five guitar like, performances he's ever seen. One of the top seen. five greatest guitar performances he had ever seen. It, should, it could have been top three, man. I tried. <laughs> I tried for top three. But I figure he's much older than me, so maybe he's seen a few guys. <laughs> exactly. You hope to get the record out this year? <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I, I wish we could just put it out. It's Look, it, it's probably going to be ready to put out in a week or two, but we're going to go through. We want to make sure it reaches the whole planet all at once. So we'll, we'll, we're going we're gonna to rush it through. We're going to try as hard as we can. So we get, tell everybody on Instagram to stop busting my balls. They're like, <laughs> every, every time I post anything, it could be about the most beautiful thing, and there's always why is this going, so uh, where's that album you were talking about? <laughs> like, it's coming. It's coming. You have played some incredible shows recently, and you were announced, Extreme has been announced as the special guest to Aerosmith on their 50th anniversary show at Fenway Park, which is already sold out. Talk about amazingly surreal moments for you. How cool is it to get that call and have that moment in your hometown? Well, man, I, I, I don't know if I'm actually doing your show or this is your life. Yeah. This is like... <laughs> So everything you bring it up, I mean, I'm so blessed and so grateful for all these, everything from the Freddie Mercury trip. I mean, it goes down the line and we're still, we're still getting these gifts, you know, these beautiful gifts of, uh, uh, I've gotten to play, you know, do some amazing stuff with, with Tyler through the last, like, maybe 10 years and do some great Talk stuff. Talk about that for people that don't know, because I remember I was doing something with Lenny Kravitz about a year oh ago God, and, right. and Stephen right. FaceTimed Lenny and I was sitting with Lenny and then I see you. On the you red in carpet, the, right? So no, we were in a studio and then I see you in the background with Steven and Steven's going Lenny and I'm going Nuno and we're like on Lenny's phone and but yeah. what, what talk about the stuff you've done with Tyler I mean look at the, the you know I've done a I got to do a few things with him but one of the cool things is I did the Kings of Chaos gig with him and in, in, uh, in uh, South Africa and you know that's just like with an all-star band with Robin Zander and Billy Gibbons and uh, Duff McKagan and you know uh, uh, Gilby Clark I don't want to leave anybody out uh, but and you do each other's songs it's, it's it's amazing. Imagine that I get to be Joe Perry for a while and do all the Aerosmith stuff, and and then Stephen was singing some of the extreme stuff, and it was just crazy. And just to do that and rehearse that with all these these are all my idols. You know, Xander's one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Period. Yeah. Most underrated. Still. To, to me, probably the, the two. I would say two of the greatest live vocalists of all time. Probably Xander and, and Tyler. Tyler right now, still now in his seventies. It is bionic. I would agree. I don't even Completely. understand. Yeah. Every time I see a show, I go and I have to show, and I, he comes to hug me, and I slap him across the. I'm like, how dare you? Like, it's it's all nothing on track. This guy is bionic at this age. You and I were both at that music care show recently, and uh, yeah. there was a part where I think it was Gavin DeGraw or whatever took the <laughs> mic and put it into Stephen's yeah, mouth just, as Stephen was like had a dinner roll in his mouth at yeah. the table, and yeah. he just nailed the and line. He still like it sounded was, like yeah, 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 yeah it still sounded like every, better than everybody else. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so and then we did this. We did a, a Muscle Shoals album where we we went back to Muscle Shoals. If you haven't seen the Muscle Shoals documentary, it's a great documentary. It's a studio down in uh, in. in Alabama where they the Stones went down and recorded and Aretha Franklin did uh, respect there and the Stones did uh, Brown Sugar so they did an album where they wanted to uh, do a bunch of songs that were recorded there by n later you know new versions of them so I did Brown Sugar with uh, with Steven down there and we were down there and all of a sudden 
I was, there was a horn section. I arranged, the, I arranged the horn section, the parts for the section for Brown Sugar. Steven's out there with me, and I'm kind of asking him to play. They're reading the sheet music. And Steven's getting all excited, and he starts jumping up and down. And he starts dancing. And then I don't know where he looks at me. He goes, I got to call Lenny. <laughs> and he's like, I'm like, what? Why Lenny? I don't know. Lenny Kravitz. And he right. goes, no, I'm going to FaceTime. He's got to hear this. And then Who I, I was with. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, and he's just going like this, and he's showing him, and he's pointing it at me, and Lenny's looking at me, and I'm like, what is, what is happening? But that's Steven, man. He's, he's crazy energy in the, in the studio. But well, look, we, 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 we've grown to become decent friends, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, they're doing the show. Doing a show in Boston with them is, is amazing enough, but doing it at Fenway Park, Fenway Park, should I say. We're doing it at Fenway Park. Nobody does Fenway Park. That's like Springsteen and, 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 and McCartney and, and things like that. I mean, talk about, you know, I, I sound almost, I don't know, it sounds pretty uh, egregious the, the, that we get to do Fenway Park as well and with our heroes uh, on, uh, in September, I believe. I don't know the date. 18th? Somebody said 18th. 18th, two days before my birthday. Perfect. Perfect. Th that, guest, that guest list is going to be a bitch, huh? It's, it already is. It already <laughs> is. It, I just I, I disconnected my, uh, I changed my number, actually, the day that was announced. <laughs> but but getting to do that, man, in a hometown at Fenway, I, I don't know. I, it just, we, we're so lucky, man. So lucky. For people that maybe, maybe didn't realize this, and we touched on it a second ago, for many years, I don't know how many exactly, you can tell me, but Nuno played guitar in Rihanna's band. Uh, and and how many years did you do that for? Uh, I, I think five. I want to say it's maybe pretty long run. Yeah, w I was, was supposed to, I was supposed to do three months. And you did five years. Yeah, I had. You know, it was interesting. We had just finished the extreme tour, the um, the the Saudade, Saudades, the, oh, yeah. the the Rocky, and uh, and I got home. And I was just like, I got a call from Tony Bruno, who's an amazing, not only guitar player, but he was the, uh, the music director for her. And he goes, he reached out to me about doing stuff before, and he goes, hey, we, we, we need a guitar player for this three-month promo run. And he said, Rihanna. And I said, why? I said, there's really no guitar on that stuff, you know? And, and he goes, that's why. He goes like she wants to rock rock it out a bit. I showed her your stuff, and she, you know, loves what you're doing. And it'd be great if you come down, and and you don't have to audition. And I go, no, I should, I'll, I'll audition. <laughs> and and I and I learned like 11 songs in a couple of days. And I, I just I thought, why not? You know, I, we we were on a break. It was kind of like the Miles Kennedy thing. You know, I was like, why not? I was on a break, and I thought, wait. And I said to him, so there's no guitar. Do I get to be me? Do I get to do? Do I get to ruin every one of her songs, <laughs> like all those hits, umbrella and stuff, and just play? And she goes, "Yes, yeah, she wants it to rock. She wants it to be heavy." And I was like, "Wow, this sounds great," because I always loved the funkier stuff, and I've always loved the R and B stuff, and I've always, it was, it was like almost like, you know, I, I was playing. It, it was a lot harder than I thought. Like I. When I was on tour w with that band, like I would do a, a guitar interview in Germany or something, like the, you know the the guitar magazines would come down and they go, "Wow, Nuno's in town. We'll do an interview." In the afternoon they come in, we do the interview, and I go, "Hey, man, here's a few passes and tickets for you guys to check out the show." And they look at each other and they go, "Like, nah, it's not really our cup of tea. Sorry, we don't want to, we don't want to do." It. And I said, "I'll tell you what, just stay for the first couple of songs. Just check it out." I'd see them after the show. Wow. They'd come in and they'd go, "Wow." I had no idea. The band was insane. The, the, the drummer played with Stevie Wonder. Like This was the, some of the greatest musicians I've ever played with, and it was all live. Her vocals were live. The only, there was only a few bells and whistles and a couple things that were coming to track, but she, it was, the band was ridiculous, and, and we, we played like our own versions of these songs. I learned a lot, actually. I learned a lot, because you know, for a guy who plays mostly rock, we had to play reggae stuff. We had to play pop stuff, dance stuff, like club tracks, you know, and, and these hats that you had to change all the time. It, it, was, it was pretty interesting, man, to have all those kind of things in your back pocket. I, I learned a great deal. I didn't know I was going to stay. After the three months were up, you know, she came over and she's like, can you do, you know, the cutest voice in the world? And uh, to say, like, would you, do the, would you do the tour? And I said, yeah, let's do it, because I was, I was pretty inspired. I learned a lot. Did you... Any nights out there, I'm sure there were a few where in that sea of pop fans, you see somebody, fucking Nuno, man! Was, you know? It was always, she would always point it out. She'd like, well, there's a Nuno sign there, and there's a, <laughs> and there, and then, but she, she, she was actually, she thought it was all kind of cute as long as there was a few signs until we got to Ireland, Scotland area, and, uh, a friend, uh, this, he became a friend, but there was a fan that came up, and he was in the front row, and I remember seeing her, seeing her face, and she was just singing, and then she just stopped singing. And she her jaw dropped, and I was like, "Well, I'll go." And the security's like, "Okay, I think something's wrong. Somebody's bothering her." And this dude lifted up. He he basically flashed her, and he lifted up, and 
on his whole torso was me tattooed, <laughs> proper tattoo <laughs> of me live from like the from the head down to his like to his waist, and it was me like me naked on his body naked, <laughs> with no shirt on playing oh, guitar, goodness. and she was looked at me and she looked at this dude and she's bringing me over like to to see him, and then and then backstage she actually took a photo with him and everything. She's like nobody's done that for me, like what the fuck. <laughs> That is awesome stuff, man. Well, listen, I, I, I thank you greatly for coming by and spending oh, some time here, man. Thanks for having me, man. We're at the Rainbow. What can yeah, be better? With, with Eddie awesome. Trunk, come yeah, on. I appreciate it, man. We've been talking about doing this for a long time. and These guys have been amazing. Audience Jeez. is great. They're always great. Appreciate everybody who's come out. Give me. 